Of course, today is a special day in the existence of the evangelical church because today is what we know to be Palm Sunday. It comes about every year that God allows us to exist, and it's called that because of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's because of what took place over 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem one week before he died for the sins of mankind. And so it's a, it's a special day. It's a, a day that thousands of years ago tells us much about worship. We certainly have studied the passage that I want to go to this morning some time ago. Um, because it's about worship, and, and this day is a day in, that I think we need to be reminded of worship, particularly uh, in our own hearts, but also just in the evangelical church at large, because this is a passage about the worshipers of Jesus Christ, and so it speaks to us. Uh, I've titled our message for today, distinguishing true worshipers, distinguishing true worshipers, and I've entitled it that because as I've thought about this day, you know, on a pastor's calendar as you go through the church calendar over the years and you preach on a regular basis, the holidays come and the holidays go, and and the one that strikes me, I think, most of all is this holiday, not necessarily Palm Sunday, but the whole Easter holiday time, because it really is the apex of Christianity. And so I've titled it this way because as I look back about this day, I'm always thrust back to this passage, this passage in John's gospel, in John chapter 12, if you're not there, and we get a glimpse at what is happening or what was happening, and it is there that we can distinguish true worshipers and false superficial worshipers. And I I think this is pertinent for us as Christians because we are always in to be that mode of evaluation. We We are certainly not losing our salvation by any means by how we live. We we certainly sin in our life. We certainly do things that we ought not do as Christians, and that displeases our Father, not because in one sense we will lose our salvation, it displeases Him because it robs His glory. And we are to be living for His glory, as 1 Corinthians 10.31 says. And so we ought to always be evaluating our life as we are going day by day in our life, what's going on in our life, how we're thinking, how we're living with one another, how we're obeying or not obeying what the Word of God says. There's this evaluation always going on, and I I want us to do that this morning in reference to our own hearts as we go to this passage for our time. And I want us to go here partly because it's Palm Sunday, but also because it's a good reminder for us about this idea of worship. And I think it's important to say that at the outset And to say that true worshipers are not those who seek after self and the fulfillment of the desires of the flesh. That's not what a true worshiper is. Uh, Certainly, I guess we could say they are worshiping in one sense. But when I'm speaking about true worshipers, I'm talking about those who worship Christ. Right? All men are worshipers in one sense. They're worshiping self or they're worshiping something or they're worshiping a God of their own making or or whatever, but as Christians, we're to be worshiping Christ. True worshipers are not those who seek self and seek the desires of their own flesh, but they are those who exhibit an attitude of selflessness. They are those who look like Christ. And there is clarity as to that reality, I think, in these verses here in John chapter 12, that because it in the preceding section to... John 12 and verse 12 and following, in that in the first 11 verses there, 
we, we find Jesus at the home of Mary and, and Martha and their brother Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. John chapter 11, Jesus does that grand miracle. He comes to their home waiting uh, providentially and, and through the divine wisdom of God longer than they wanted him to wait. He waited two days even after he heard the news and Lazarus, of course, had, by the time he had gotten there, had been in the grave now four days. And so Jesus is there and raises Lazarus from the dead. And all three of them, while we're not going to spend any time in the verses before this, but all three of them are selfless as they worship Jesus. Martha is selfless in her service to the Lord. She, she wasn't that in the previous account when Jesus went to their home, but now she is selflessly serving the Lord. Lazarus was selfless in his desire to fellowship with the Lord, and of course Mary is selfless in her complete sacrifice to the Lord. None of those expressions of worship in their lives came by chance. None of them were the outflow of some kind of originating effort in their own heart. What was happening with them was the outward reflection of their encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ and their realization that he is in fact God. And so they're, they're living that out in a selfless expression of love towards Jesus Christ. And I think that's an important thought for us to remember as we begin our time today on this, this Palm Sunday. As a pastor and as a Christian, as I... As I evaluate my own life and evaluate the landscape of evangelicalism, I find that there are far too many times and far too many professing believers that are living lives that do not reflect a relationship with Jesus Christ. It does not reflect an interaction with him. And personal evaluation is, as I said, part of the Christian context. That's, that's who we are to be. We are to be evaluating all the time. I mean, Paul even said to the Corinthian believers, look, examine yourself and test yourself. See if you're even in the faith. He, he wasn't saying that because he was doubting their profession of faith. He was saying, listen, if your life is reflecting paganism, then you ought to be wondering whether you actually are true. And so there was this evaluation going on, and we ought to be evaluating our lives in light of the scriptural truth and practice. And therefore, I say all that because it's an ugly fact of our lives that far too often, I think, if we're actually looking in the mirror at ourselves and are honest with ourselves, we find far too often where we are mere hearers of the word only rather than doers of the word. Would you not say that of your own self? We just sit here this morning as a Christian. We just say, yeah, you know, I hear a lot of the word, but man, I wish I could do it more. I wish I was doing it more. You know, we have a tendency oftentimes as Christians to boast of great things in our Christian life. But far too often in reality, that's all it is. It's just empty boasting. And as I look at my own heart at times, and as I look at the evangelical landscape of our day, it's that that concerns me. It's that that is that the, sometimes the, the, the bright light in my evaluation. It concerns me for two primary reasons. One is this, that I wonder how many professing believers are actually living a deceived life. That they're actually, say that they're going through they're, they are Christians, but they're really just going through outward motions that look like Christianity, but they truly don't know him inwardly. We all know the passage, the frightening passage in Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus, when he says at the end, they say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we do these things in your name? Matthew 7, verse 21, and Jesus says, I never knew you. I never knew you. They they're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven because Jesus had never had a relationship with them. That's a frightening reality. They, they had certainly thought they were believers. And yet in the end, their life was a sham. And the second reason for that concern is that in actual Christians, why does it seem so normal to have that kind of ebb and flow in the Christian life, whereby we are hearers of the word, but 
but we're not real consistent at being a doer of the word. Why does it seem so difficult for professing Christians to be consistently obedient? And I know, I know we can give an easy answer to that question. We, we can say, well, it's because we're not yet perfect and we still sin. The, the big picture answer, right, about the heart. That's part of it, sure, right? Even true Christian sin, we, we do things we ought not do. But I don't think that takes us back far enough to the ultimate cause. Because that seems to be a rationalization for why we have no need to work at not sinning. Right? In other words, I know I can't win, so why try? That's, that's the idea sometimes that our fleshly heart likes to, likes to sell us. But what I'm thinking about is the cause for that kind of thinking. The cause for the kind of thinking that says, well, this side of heaven I can't win, so why should I even strive to win? I mean, if we truly know Christ, then according to God, we have all we need for life and godliness, Paul, or Peter says, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. That, those words in that text in 2 Peter haunt me as a Christian because I can't ever say with any satisfaction in my heart, well, I can't try. Because God has given me everything I need. So we must be able to do it. The question is, why don't we? Well, in the book of James, we're reminded of some very important truths concerning genuine Christian character. By the way, this is just all introductory stuff, so we'll get there in a minute, I think. I think. The entire book of James is really laying out a a practical test, really, that that each professing Christian can take. They can can go and and go through the book of James, and it's a practical test to, to help you evaluate your Christian life and to inventory your life as to where your faith is. And he gives, really, 13 practical test questions in James, and It's something that we can ask ourselves. We can ask ourselves, so how am I doing in this area of my Christianity? How does my life stack up to what God describes as Christian living? And the first is this. How do you respond to trials in life, right? We we go there when we're struggling with a difficulty in our life. We think about trials and we go to James, right? Count it all joy when you face various trials, brethren. Right? What happens in me, in my inner life, when trials and temptations come to me? What do I do with them? How do I respond to them? And James goes on to say, your response to them is a direct reflection of your understanding of the purpose of trials in your life and where we truly get the strength to continue victoriously in them. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 18, he, that, that's, that's really the idea. He, he's expounding that. So the first test is how do we deal with trials? The second is how do we respond to the Word of God? In other words, what do you do with the Word of God? Verses 19 through 27 and following speak to that issue. And James really just boiling it down, and I'm trying to just kind of give us a synopsis of this, James is really saying, keep yourself unpolluted from the world. He doesn't mean, like Paul said to the Corinthians, he doesn't mean take yourself out of the world. You can't do that. This is the place that God has us until he brings us home. But we can understand from the world, he means the the thinking of the world, the philosophy of the world, the way the world does things. Therefore, don't, don't, Respond in the way the world responds. Don't live in the way the world lives. Don't don't speak the way the world. Don't love that which the world loves. And there, that's where we get the greatest problem, I think, in our Christianity. Far too often we buy into the thinking and the philosophy of the world. And while we would say we're not polluted with the world, we really are. We become polluted by the world in our minds 
we come polluted by the world in our own thinking and it gets reflected in how we live. And oftentimes it's so subtle we don't even realize it's happening. Here's why I say this. Here's why I say this, why this is all just kind of percolating in my mind. Because here in the West, here in the United States of America, in the westernized world, we live in cultures that are dominated by a philosophy that if you have a king, that's a bad thing. And if you were born here and you've grown up here, then you've never lived in a country where the primary rule is from a sole monarch. Never lived under that. Our forefathers decided to throw off the rule of a monarch and rule ourselves. In a lot of ways, that was good. We've enjoyed the benefits of, of that kind of thinking. But in many ways, it wasn't good because it has bred and developed in the hearts of all of us, whether we'd like to admit it or not, it's bred into us a desire for no king. There'll be no king over me. Anytime someone comes along and declares rulership over us, there's a fight against it. Unless, unless for the benefit of us, the new rulership will take the current oppression, whatever that is, take it away and give me the ease with which I've always desired. That isn't, however, our only problem here in the West. Because even though we, we've thrown off the rule of kingship, even those countries where kingship is still alive and well in our world, they too have begun to silently look for a new king. And they look for a new king any time the current one is no longer allowing them to do what they want to do. And so here in the West, we have no real concept of kingship over us. And in other places, kingship has been reduced to someone who gives us what we want rather than what we need. And of course, the abuse of those who hold the monarchy are certainly, we could have arguments about that or discussions about that ad infinitum because that has been clearly established through the historical record of humanity. And oftentimes we would not blame them for wanting another king. But when it comes to our Christianity, we have to understand that we do have a king. We have a monarch. And he is not a king that is here to give us what we want. He is a king that always gives us what we need most. And for all mankind, that is a way to live according to the design of our maker, which is to glorify him in all that we do. And so he made a way of salvation, which only comes through him. So true worshipers understand who their king is. True worshipers understand who their king is. Now, I, I, I said all that just to have that kind of laying as a foundation on our mind as we approach this text here in John chapter 12. Because when we look at this passage, there are two groups here that we can identify clearly. Two different crowds of people. One understands who Jesus is and the other does not. Both of them are attracted to Jesus, but only one truly knows him. Both appear outwardly to worship, but only one truly worships. And all of this is taking place because Jesus Christ is entering Jerusalem as king. And that's the whole point of this text. Jesus is king. Notice what it says here, beginning in verse 12. On the next day, the great multitude who had come to the feast, talking about the feast of Passover, as you can see from verse 1, 
When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him. And they began to cry out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. And so the multitude who bore with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead were bearing him witness. For this cause also the multitude went and met him because they heard that he had performed this sign. And the Pharisees therefore said to one another, You see, that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. Jesus is entering Jerusalem as king. That's what he is. And the word of God is to be fulfilled in that reality. Well, what part is being fulfilled? That's the question. What part of the Word of God is being fulfilled? Well, for that answer, you have to be reminded of the prophecy concerning the 70 weeks of Daniel, back in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. In other words, you're not going to fully grasp this passage unless you go back there and really immerse yourself in it. And yet, for our time today, we can't do that fully. That would take a couple weeks. Easter will be long gone by then. But for our time today, since we're not going to do that, I need to just make reference to it, because I want us to have this in our mind as we look at this. In Daniel 9, of course, there is a vision, a prophecy from Daniel given to him while Israel was in captivity in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had taken them into captivity by God's providential plan in order to teach Israel some lessons about obeying him. They had been disobedient to God for years and years and years, and God had warned them over and over again, if you do not do this, you're going to pay the price for it. And of course, that was through the hand of Nebuchadnezzar and the Chaldeans. And God says to Daniel that a length of time was to go by from from that moment of captivity until the day when Israel's sin would be finished. And everlasting righteousness would be brought in. And the span of time was 70 weeks. Why we call it the 70 week vision of Daniel. And when you study that passage, it is clear that the weeks that are spoken of there are not weeks as we count weeks, seven days, Sunday to Saturday, like our calendar. But they are, each week consists really of years. It is speaking of seven years. So each week is, is seven years of time. And so seven sevens or 49 years in that prophecy are to go by in the rebuilding of Jerusalem in the Jerusalem temple. And you can read about that in Ezra and Nehemiah and the completion of the temple and the decree that went out there to go to let them go back and rebuild the temple. Well, after that temple is built and Jerusalem is restored, there's a length of time of 62 sevens that was to elapse until it says, Messiah the Prince comes and is cut off from the people. So after Jerusalem is restored, you have the 62 sevens that go on. So a total of, with the first seven, 69 weeks. 69 weeks needed to pass from the start of rebuilding the temple until Christ came and was cut off. And so 483 years, that's 69 weeks of years, 483 years after the the decree to rebuild the temple, Christ was to come as king and be cut off from his people, and of course that's speaking of his death. 
we'll talk about that at our early service on next Lord's Day. So that is the key prophecy which is being fulfilled here in John chapter 12. It is Daniel chapter 9. The entry of our Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem in such a grand manner was the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel's 69th week when the Messiah, the Prince, would formally and officially present himself to Israel as king. Jesus comes, and it is the fulfillment of that prophecy here in John chapter 12. <clears throat> so Daniel 9 is partially being fulfilled. It isn't completely fulfilled here. It's just this 69th week. It's a partial part of that entire prophecy is being fulfilled here. But also, Zechariah 9 is also partly being filled. Daniel 9 speaks to the when this would happen, the 69th week, 483 years after the decree of the temple. And Zechariah's prophecy tells us how it will happen. So Daniel says when it will happen. Zechariah 9 tells us how it would happen. In Zechariah 9, verse 9, it says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, talking about Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so here you have John bringing these things by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the forefront. The Messiah, the king has come, and the response is twofold. Just like it is today. It's twofold. There are those who hail Jesus as coming. He's the coming one who would set them free. Not from sin, but from the oppression that is over them. Jesus was the one to come in their minds who would give them freedom from the trouble they were in. In their minds, Jesus was the answer to their difficulty. And yet there are those who are hailing him in his coming because he's God. He has come to set them free from sin so that they might glorify him as God had designed and created them to do. And this is the distinguishing reality between true worshipers and those who are not true worshipers. This is the difference between those who attach themselves to Christ for what he can do for them and those who are attached to Christ because of what he has done for them. That's the difference between those who want a king to set them free from the troubles of life and those who serve their king within the circumstances of life because they know that he is the only one who can give them spiritual life. In the first group we find here in verses 12 through and 13. On the next day, a great multitude who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him, and began to cry, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. These are those who had heard that Jesus was coming. They had heard that Jesus was coming. Who were they hearing that from? Who are they hearing this news that the king is coming? That the one who is going to save us is coming? Who are they hearing that from? Well, they were hearing it from the next group, the true worshipers. Verse 17 says the true worshipers were bearing witness. They were the ones who were with Jesus when, when Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. They, they knew who Jesus was. They saw who Jesus was. They were believing in Jesus, and these are hearing it. And when they heard it, they came to the feast. 
as part of their religious duty, they were, they were there at the Passover. They were there keeping the law. This was their religious duty. They were there in order to participate in the celebration. Every Jew had to be ceremonially clean for the Passover, and so they would come early in order to go through that ceremonial cleansing process. In fact, according to some historical estimates of the day, the crowd was close to two and a half million people in Jerusalem that week. Years ago, I've been to the old city of Jerusalem, what was built in the 1500s. The wall of Jerusalem now was the old city was built in the 1500s by Suleiman the Magnificent. But it's not the old city wall of the city of David in Jerusalem as it was then, and it was probably even smaller then than it is now. And you can imagine two and a half million people stuffed into that little place. It was amazing. And when the crowd hears that Jesus is coming into the city, they run out and grab palm branches, hence the reason we call this Palm Sunday. And they begin to lay them down on the ground and cry out, Hosanna! Hosanna! It's, a, it's really an amazing pronouncement that they're making. In Hebrew, that word literally means, save us! That's what they're saying. Save us. Here he comes. The king's coming. Save us. Give salvation now to us. They're doing what every good Jew would be doing. They're quoting, really, from the Psalms. They're quoting from Psalm 118, verse 26. Psalm 118, verse 26 says this very thing here. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's what it says. The, the, the psalms are, are, are very tied to the celebration of the Passover. And one they sung each morning during the Feast of Tabernacles was Psalm 118. They would have known it well. And each Jew would have understood it to be a psalm of announcement about their king. But their pronouncement isn't for Christ, the Savior. It isn't for him to save them from their sin. It's save us from the situation. Save us from what's going on. We know that intellectually because in a week's time, these same people are the ones who are saying crucify him. They're waiting for the day when when what they believed the Messiah would do, that he would come and save them from the oppression of their Roman overlords the one king that was over them and to many who were there that day had come I think about that every year I think that's the very same reason many flock to God today isn't it they just rush to God in times of, I mean listen 9-11 told us that churches were packed after 9-11 for a while flocking to God out of fear. Maybe God can help us. And sadly, part of it's because of the gospel they hear. People say all the time, come to Christ. Come to Christ. He'll fix all your problems. Come to Christ, Jesus. Come to Jesus. Life is going to get better. Come to Jesus. I mean, the largest church in America is filled with that kind of nonsense. Come to Jesus. Life's difficulties will be in. It's your best life now. Make a decision for Christ. Everything will be better. Our flesh loves that kind of message. We love that. We love that. People flock to that kind of shallow gospel. They love it. They love it whether they read it in a book, whether they hear it in a church, even though it's a false gospel, even though it's not the one of Scripture. Christ never said, come unto me, all you are having trouble in life, and I'll fix it for you. He never said that. He did say, come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Why? Because that's what we need, because we're heavy laden. That's what we're, our trouble is. It's not the troubles of life. The troubles of life are a result of sin in us and in the world. That's where the trouble comes. So we need to rest from trying to work our way into the kingdom of God because it never will happen through us. 
It only comes through faith in Jesus Christ, who is the rightful king. But Christ doesn't desire to fix our problems. His desire is to transform us, to make us new, to make us with such a heart that we'll respond to life in a God-glorifying way so that we can do and worship Him rightly. It's, it's even born subtly in how we talk about worship. Oftentimes we will talk about worship, and, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way for any of us, but, but sometimes we talk about worship when we say we have a worship team or a worship band as if music is worship. If that's, if that's how def, uh, worship is defined, through music. But worship, beloved, is right now. Worship is praying to God. Worship is singing to God. Worship is being together uh, as the family of God. Worship is serving God when you're, when you're outside uh, helping your neighbor's car be fixed because he needs your help. Worship is serving as long as you're honoring God in your service. That's worship to God. So this first group are people simply and superficially attached to Christ. They believe that Christ is going to rescue them from the trouble of life. Come, save us, Hosanna. But the second group, they're attached supernaturally and sufficiently to Christ because of what he is going to do for them, because of who he is. And therefore, notice what they are doing. Notice what the contrast here in verse 17 and so the multitude who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb, that's a, that's a different group than this great multitude who had come to him at the feast in, chapter, in verse 12. Now this is the multitude who were with him when he, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb. And notice it doesn't, John doesn't say when he raised Lazarus from the dead. John says when he called him from the tomb, Lazarus, get up. Why? Because Jesus has the power over all that. He didn't have to go, okay, now some magic thing, I'll raise you from the dead. And now, okay, now let, no, he just says, Lazarus, come on, let's go. That's the quickness and the power of God on life. Verse 17 says, and so the multitude who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and then raised him from the dead were bearing him witness. Just as change was seen in the lives of Martha and Mary, and of course Lazarus, he was dead in the grave. He's been a, an absolute change with Lazarus in his encounter with Christ. So too are these who were changed because of it. Our text says they're bearing witness. You notice that? They were bearing him witness. That means they're going around spreading the good news about Jesus Christ. Here's the one who can save us. We know Martha understood that. She said to Jesus, if you'd have been here sooner, he, he'd be alive. And Jesus said, don't you believe I am the resurrection and the life? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know we'll have a resurrection in the future. But she says, Martha, only believe. They're bearing him witness. They're going around spreading the good news. In fact, they're part of the reason, as I said earlier, that the others came out to see Jesus as he enters Jerusalem. They were going out because of the witness of these faithful worshipers. They were witnessing for Christ in spite of the threats made to them. In fact, verse 57 of chapter 11 says, Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should be he should report it that they might seize him. They're threatening everybody around. Listen, don't follow Jesus Christ. You follow Jesus Christ and you're in trouble. So in spite of the threats, they're giving testimony of Christ. These are true believers. These are true believers. I think right here we have an example. We have a picture of what happens in a life when we come to understand that Jesus is in fact our king. 
that he is to be worshipped. When, when you and I as Christians understand who we are in light of who he is, the, the only natural response that we ought to have is the response that Paul says in Romans 12 verses 1 and 2, right? The reasonable service of worship is to live for Christ. And part of living for Christ is going and telling others about our King. True worshipers tell others about who they worship. Why? Well, because they know that their King and the desire of others is to know Him. They know their King. They want others to know Him. No matter what the, what the threat was in word and deed, they just said, I want you to know my king. I want you to know Jesus. Come, see Jesus. doesn't matter the others might think about them. doesn't matter if they thought they were weird people. doesn't matter if others might ostracize them. Some of you might be saying, well, didn't that, didn't that what Peter was doing at the trial of Jesus Christ? Yes, we all have sinful moments, don't we? There are times when we know we ought to share Christ. We don't. It doesn't matter what others might think of us. It doesn't matter what others might do to ostracize us. It doesn't matter that they might be able to throw questions in our way that we can't answer. And so we fear even bringing it up because we don't want to be somehow embarrassed by them. No, true worshipers just want others to come to know their Savior. True worshipers can easily say before a holy God and with a genuine conscience, I don't know the answer to that, but I know my God is still the Savior. And unless you believe, you too will perish. You say, were they effective? Well, verse 18, notice, for this cause also the multitude went and met him. <laughs> They were bearing witness of him, and it was because of that that the multitude went and met him, because they heard he had done what he had done. They had heard about the attesting miracle, which showed who he actually was, and so they were going out. They were effective. In fact... Because they're witnessing, the Pharisees sarcastically say, verse 19, everybody's going out after him. The whole world, what you're doing isn't any good. There's some infighting going on within the Pharisees now. They're looking at one another and saying, see all the words you've said, see all the things you've tried to do, see all the, the ways in which you've tried to halt this movement. It's doing no good. Everybody's going out to see Jesus. That's how effective their witnessing was. Oh, that the world would say because of us, look who is hearing of Christ. Wouldn't that be awesome? Beloved, it's Palm Sunday. This is a day filled, ought to be filled with gospel testimony. That's what true worshipers were doing. They were just giving the gospel testimony about Jesus Christ. This is Palm Sunday. That's how it ought to be. It ought not be us living like the world, doing what the world does, professing great things, and yet worshiping someone who isn't the king. This is the true king. So I say to us, let this, let this be the beginning of a revival of sorts. Maybe this will be a revival for us of sorts in our own hearts as we begin the resurrection week. What this is, a, a week whereby we are, we are acutely uh, focused on and it comes before us, it seems at every turn, that Christ has risen from the dead. Let us show others just how to worship our King by telling them about Him. May God help us to be unpolluted by the world.
unpolluted by how the world thinks and its shallowness so that we would bow our knee to our Savior in worship, true worship. As we selflessly serve Him, as we selflessly fellowship with one another, as we selflessly sacrifice ourselves for our King, as we selflessly witness to others about Jesus Christ. May that be the focus of this day, Palm Sunday. I love how John records verse 20 and 21. Now, there were certain Greeks among those who were going up to the worship at the feast. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and they began to ask him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. <laughs> we wish to see Jesus. And Philip comes and says to his brother, Hey, hey, I got these guys. They, they want to see Jesus. And so they tell Jesus. And Jesus says, listen, there's coming a day when I'm going to be glorified. Jesus is speaking. Not just a few days from now. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies and remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. For he who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world shall keep it to eternal, to life eternal. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Where I am, there shall my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Would you pray with me? Lord, we recognize that you are our king. You're the one who came to save sinners like us. We acknowledge your majesty before all people. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be worshipped. And as we contemplate the wonder of who you are, the great power with which you raised us to life in you, may that impel us to tell others about you also. Father, strengthen us to not shrink back, but rather be bold so that the world around us can say what the unbelieving leaders were saying that day. The whole world is going after him. Father, let that be the testimony of this resurrection time. Transform us. Transform our hearts for your glory. And for the sake of our Savior, for it is in his name that we pray. Amen.